Let's, Judge Ward, could you recount for us, tell us something about how you came to meet Jerry Ford, the situations are... That you asked me how I met Jerry Ford. It was back in 1931. We'd graduated from uh, high school, he out of Grand Rapids, and I graduated out of uh, Detroit Northwestern High School and went up to Ann Arbor. We met in the orientation hall, Waterman's Gym, as I recall it. Jerry came up and said, I'm Jerry Ford from Grand Rapids. I knew that uh, he was an all-state uh, football player uh, in high school, the same team that I was on, so I knew him, and we started talking at orientation, the very first day of orientation in 1931, September. And from that first meeting, Jerry Ford and I have been personal friends ever since. He was, uh, uh, to me, there was an air of, uh, of amiability, there was an air of, uh, of decency, and an air of fairness from the very beginning that he has never lost in so far as my knowledge of him since that time in 1931. It was kind of unusual because if we recall, you were one of the first blacks to play at Michigan, yet the president was one of the first people to come up and talk to you. Well, not one of the first. I was the first. Uh, people lose sight of the fact that back in those days, outside the solid South, very few schools used black athletes. Uh, I was the first at Michigan in 1931, the first to play since 1898. I tried to recall how many had played prior to the time that I played football at Michigan. And the best I could come to was seven in the whole conference. And the South was segregated at that time. And many of us, in talking to the young people today, the blacks, youth trying to instill some type of inspiration, when we talk about how bleak it was during those times, they think it's uh, ancient history. and. Uh, uh, just not true. They look at basketball today, baseball today, football today, track today, and they think it has always been. But if they could just some way recapture the travails that we went through, then they could really appreciate a person like Jerry Ford who would step outside the normal uh, conduct and uh, make the overture that he made and to be the fast friend that he's been uh, it's quite easy now to be a friend of a black person, uh, say, easier than it was back there then. Back there then, you were subject to being ostracized if you became too involved with blacks. And that was a test of Jerry, that despite that, he was a man, although he was only 17 years old. Tell us, can you tell us a little bit of the kind of, kind of football player that uh, the president was? You mentioned that he was a two-way man and more well, hostile and agile. And you asked me what kind of a ball player he was. I resented the press when they said that uh, Jerry played without a helmet and uh, in a deprecatory way, regardless of who the remark is attributed to. Uh, they didn't know Jerry or didn't care to let the public know type of person he was. Back in, th in the 30s, you were 60-minute ball players and coaches recruited 60 minutes. You played defense, you played offense. If you were good on defense and couldn't play offense, you didn't play. If you could play offense and couldn't play defense, you couldn't play. With respect to a center, the center was not under the, uh, the, the quarterback was not under the center. That was changed during World War II. They changed it so that in order to pass in the, under the old system, you had to be five yards behind the line of scrimmage. Now this meant then that the center had to, if he were under, if, uh, the quarterback was under the center, he had to fade back five yards before he could throw a legitimate pass. This was a key. So if the 
quarterback faded back, it was pass. They changed that to let offense catch up with defense. Put the center, the quarterback, under the center, then let him pass anywhere behind the line of scrimmage, which made it more deceptive to defend against because he could flip that ball to that tight end cutting across and pick up seven yards before you could adjust. Now what did this do with the center? Under the old system under which Jerry played, the center had to be as knowledgeable about the plays to call as the quarterback. Because if you couldn't pass unless you were five yards deep, the center had to pass the ball to the deep man or the second back, or he had to pass to the quarterback to feed off to the halfback coming across on the double wing. You only had uh, three basic formations, the single wing, the double wing, and the modified pump. But the center had nowhere to snap that ball. If the break was right, he had to give that back lead. If the break was left, he had to give him lead. If it was straight into the line, he had to give it to him straight to him. Now, if he passed the ball wrong, he would be responsible for the fumble. He had to know the back that was getting the ball in a fashion that a very good offensive center today never had to know. Because the quarterback is the one that's going to get the ball feet and hand off with the exception of the punt and the kick today. And you, any of us have seen, even the pros have had problems with uh, uh, points after touchdown field goals. Inserting the ball accurately deep, or centering the ball accurately on the punt. Well, this was a regular thing and, and, and ball when we played it, so Jerry, who played center, had never made a bad pass. I don't remember Jerry ever making a bad pass. And I would suspect that even though in our senior years, when we didn't win a game, excepting the Georgia Tech game, one reason why Jerry was singled out of a team that had such an awful record to play in the Shrine game and the college all-star game, it must have been because of his accuracy as a center and knowledge of the game and doing things right, because it was most important, because there were teams in the Big Ten Conference who beat us who had nobody on the college all-star game and the Shrine game. And I'm reasonably certain nobody had a crystal ball back there in 1931 and said, we'll put Jerry Ford on the All-Star game or the Shrine game simply because in 1976 he'll be running for president of these United States. He did it on merit as it was then. Good. Let me uh, hold you for just a second, Judge, and let me have a camera. There seems to be a lighting thing. They want me to check on If you just excuse us a moment. So I had a handkerchief. Put the forehead in. Well, no, that no, no, no that'll start popping out. Okay. All right, this is take two of uh, Willis Ward, a continuing series of interviews. All right, we are. Okay, ready. give me the beep. And we are up to speed. Sorry, I said we are ready for their sake. Oh, yeah. there are two kinds. You are at speed. All right. Okay. You were asking me about uh, some of the differences in football today uh, as against the time when Jerry and I played. I should think that the ingredients you hear coaches talk about uh, back there then is the same now. They want agility. They want hostility. And they want mobility. Now, back before World War II, the players that played on good ball clubs had to go 60 minutes. Now they had to be mobile, hostile, and agile, as it's been known, as they said. If you were strong enough to play defense, but not quick enough to play offense, you could not play. If you're quick enough to play offense, not strong enough to play defense, you could not play. So lines generally ran on a good team somewhere between 200 to 220 pounds because you had to have that ingredient, those combinations to play no substitution. Now come World War II with unlimited substitution, putting the quarterback under the center, it changed so that a center now doesn't have to be noted for agility. He must be hostile. He must be strong, 
because he centers blocks. He doesn't have to know all the plays, just know the count. Hand it to the quarterback, quarterback knows the plays. Many very fine centers today would not have played on great teams back there before World War II. Wow, by that same token, you can't think of an end, a defensive end, and an established college team today playing defense who weighed 180, 185 pounds, not defense. It's 220, 215, 225. Standard, you look at any lineup. So you see the game changed. Now, Jerry had to play both ways like I did. And we were not known as having a light line, although I don't think we averaged over 200 pounds from end to end. So those are the differences that we, we, we see in the game. And it uh, required uh, uh, knowledge of the game and a certain amount of, uh, of grit and determination, which was there. And so it's not, it's not surprising to those of us who played with Jerry Ford that when uh, he was asked to uh, be the vice president and they looked over his record that he would pass the test. He was only, that's all we know him. Fair, honest, decent, good, able man who never had problems with eligibility at a school that was known for tough standards. It was hard to get in, hard to stay in. He made it. And I don't think he went to a law school that was a uh, uh, cram school. I understand that Yale Law School is a fairly decent law school. And I don't think they're going around giving law degrees to people because they are, they like them. And I don't think that they're clairvoyant there enough to know that they were given a degree to, to a guy that one day would be president of the United States. He had to earn it. So we're not surprised, Jerry. None of us. We're not surprised at all that Jerry passed the test and has done a good job as president of these United States. We expected it of him. What, what about the allegation that, uh, not the allegation, but the, the president played on a, a team didn't win too many games. Didn't win but one game, and that was a and game I sat on the bench on. He never seemed to give up, did he? No, he, that's not like him to give up. And uh, uh, you don't talk of Jerry Ford in the, in the sense of a quitter. Uh, you look at him on TV even today, I can see him just like he was when he was tow-headed, uh, that blonde hair over his head, uh, over his forehead, coming out with his chin jutted out. You push him, and he fights. You push him. He's not going around with a chip on his shoulder, but he's nobody's pushover by any stretch of the imagination. Can you recall any kind of uh, attempt to push him over that might have happened in, in your... Well, he took care of himself. And uh, obviously, every time he got out to play, the guys on the other side tried to push you over. <laughs> but no, uh, he was a good ball player. He played on two undefeated ball clubs, lettered three years that he earned his letters. He earned them. There's no gifts. And uh, he played behind an All-American center, Chuck Bernard, who got there first in Michigan during that time. The seniors were given uh, precedence over junior classmen, and you had to wait your turn. Well, the captain of the team when I was there got injured my sophomore year, and uh, fortunately I was able to play as a sophomore. But Chuck Bernard was an all Big, all big Ten center his so uh, sophomore year, and an All-American his uh, junior senior year. Never got hurt. As I said, uh, uh, you had limited substitution, and for two years Jerry came in, uh, at that time, but when it, his turn came, uh, he was the number one center on our 1934 team. It was hurt by the Georgia game, in which uh, I was sadly benched. It hurt Jerry badly. Uh, Tell us about that story about, about the Southern School. Yeah. Well, back there, you see, uh, the, the Southern teams, uh, one of the things we said comment about today is to see uh, Bear Bryant at Alabama and the coaches at Georgia and Georgia Tech and and Tennessee and all those fine schools are playing the black kids today. When uh, Jerry and I played, they wouldn't book, nor would they feel their teams if a black kid was on the team. So we look at it and, uh, uh, and with a sense of uh, 
regret that it came late, but a great deal of, uh, of um, satisfaction that at least it's gotten to the point we can go to a ball game now and cheer for anybody. If a guy now came from Georgia, he'll go out and cheer, cheer for Georgia. But I remember when they weren't about to go out and cheer for Georgia, Alabama, a black guy would go out and cheer for the team playing them because of it. But it's changed, and that's all to the good. Now, when we played Georgia Tech, I was benched. It hurt Jerry Ford badly. He uh, wrote to his father, wanted to quit the team. And his father left it up to him. And of course, he was prevailed upon by the alumni to play the game. So he played. But on Monday morning, he uh, and Bill Borgman told me that they'd done something during the game for me, and they dedicated that particular block to me. And I'll never forget it. Uh, he was very hurt. It ruined our ball club, and that's why that 7-1 season, I'll always believe, it killed the morale of the ball club, uh, uh, and uh, the competition was too tight for a team without morale to prevail to the Big Ten. Without being too explicit, just describe for us what Jerry did for you. Well, one, one of the players, and the, you ask me what Jerry did? Well, it seemed it seem as though as the game uh, got started. Uh, the fellow on the other side of the line made a remark about him loving people like me. And his adjectives were not, uh, they're bleep adjectives, so I won't use it. Whereupon uh, Jerry and Bill Boykman put a block on him that ended that fellow's participation in the game. So they came back uh, that Monday and uh, told me that they dedicated that block to me. Uh, <laughs> Very good. <laughs>